my name's Justin, um, as it says up there. I'm from a group called the London Campaign Against Police and State Violence. Not exactly a catchy name, but you can see what we do. We were formed in 2013 after I and a few others got called about um, predominantly black men in the community in a short period of time. It was uh, the month of July and a soldier called Lee Rigby had recently been killed in South London. And it appeared, I can't prove it, but it appeared that the police were taking revenge on any black person, any black man they could find. People were getting beaten up and we came together, some families um, who were directly affected by this and activists to support the families get justice for people who got brutalized by the police because they happen to be black and walking on the street or black and being in a phone box or black and driving. Those are the circumstances that brought the campaign together. And I approached Lee to put this event together and share not only our experiences and our history, but look at how can we as a community support one another and continue our struggle for justice. Because though the inquest got an apology, justice still hasn't really been done. The police are still dodging their responsibility today. And they can only do it with the community support. So our campaign is supporting Lee, but we also need the, the community to support Lee and the family to get justice. So I'm s now here with two distinguished speakers. We've got Sherelle Brown from the United States, who's been very active and involved in the Black Lives Matter movement and she'll speak on that. And we have Akala, a poet, a rapper, a scholar, in my view, who will give his view about how can we continue to build the struggle, how can we continue to progress, and hopefully he can end um, with a performance as well. Okay, so I'm now gonna turn over to Sherelle Brown. Can we please give her a warm Brixton welcome? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Peace, family. Um, I just want to say thank you for the warm welcome. I am here in London now for the next year uh, doing a master's in culture, diaspora, and ethnicity, human rights, um, so I can learn from you guys and go back to the US and, and cause more trouble. Um, it's an honor to be here. I just want to say that I didn't know anyone, and when I got here, Justin hit me up, and it's strange to be so far from everything you know and still feel at home. So thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'm a call and response girl, and I like uh, audience participation. So I want you to do something with me, family. Is that cool? Is that cool? Yeah. Ashe. All right, I want you to do three things. On the count of three, I want you to say your name. And then on the count of three again, I want you to say the name of a person who has either lost their life to state violence or is the reason why you're in the room today or the reason why you continue to fight, okay? And then on the count of three, you're gonna say present. So your name, the name of the person who brought you here, the reason why you're still fighting today, and then we're gonna say present. We clear? If you're not, ask your neighbor because I don't know how else to explain it, okay? All right, your name on the count of three, your entire name. One, two, three. Justin Bay. Some of you have some long names. <laughs> All right. Now the person who brings you here, the reason why you do this work or the reason why you stay encouraged or hopeful or fighting. Okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. And then on the count of three, we're going to say present. We're going to bring them into this space. Okay? One, two, three. Present. Ashe, those who spoke before me really laid it out beautifully. Um, but I do that exercise to remind us why we are here, uh, to also remind us that the past is not dead, the past n is not even the past. Um, and I, like Justin said, I am a part of Black Lives Matter movement in the States. I was down in Ferguson uh, doing organizing work there last year and this year and in New York. Um, and when we say Black Lives Matter, that doesn't mean some lives, some black lives. That doesn't mean the black lives that went to college, right? Or the black male lives, or black American lives, but all black lives. And I, was re uh, I remember that uh, when in Ferguson, 
I remember I was shot with a, a rubber bullet one night out protesting. And for those of you who don't know, a rubber bullet is a regular bullet wrapped in rubber, right? And I remember tending to the bruise and looking on Twitter and I saw a picture of, of people in London came out in thousands in the streets uh, in the name of Mike Brown with their hands up. And I thought, what a beautiful, beautiful moment right now to be alive and to be black in this world. The name I call when I do this exercise is Nelson Mandela because he reminds us that the work that we are doing, while we act locally, we must think globally and we must make those transnational connections. So I just want to talk to you briefly about what that means. We must continue to build together, to learn from each other, you know, because trust me, the white supremacists in my government and in my police stations are working from the same playbook as the ones in your government and in your police stations, right? And we have to remember this righteous kinship and that we all have a part of this liberation work. Your role may not be at the marches. Your role may not be speaking publicly, right? Your role may not be getting arrested, as I have been several times for protesting. You know, you may be the sister who can cook and keep me fed, right? You may be the sister who can watch some children while we strategize about what to do next. But everybody in this room has a role, down to the allies in the space. Allies, if you're here, you may not experience anti-black state violence, but you also have uh, something to do. Support these community organizations here in Brixton and here in London. If you, know, if you know nothing else to do and you are well off, write a check to your youth center or your community organization. Secondly, we can't allow the oppressor to define for us what our resistance looks like. As I sat here and learned of this rich history of the uprisings in 85 and again in 2011, I was thinking to myself, what was the media saying? Were they saying like they did this year and last year, look at these thugs, look at these kids rioting for no reason and looting, look at this violence. We wanna get behind you, but you guys are, are, are acting out. You're, you're violent right now. And what they never do is square their critiques on the violence that we are responding to. White supremacy is violence. Killing a young man and leaving him in the streets for four and a half hours is violence. Shooting our mothers in front of our children is violence. Criminalizing neighborhoods so that you can then move people out into jails and move in luxury condos where there's bricks in a Harlem, that is violence. <laughs> it is white supremacist violence. And the way we respond to that, the way we navigate that, the way we've been responding to that for 500 years going from Jamaica to Haiti to Harlem to Brixton, that is not violence, that is resistance. That is our survival. And we've been doing it beautifully for 500 years going. So I want to sincerely thank the elders in this space who spoke before me. Thank you for your work, brother. Thank you for your work, sisters. Thank you for making this world just a little bit more uh, able to navigate for me. And I know that I must continue the work. And I want to close the way I began with a call and response, if that's OK. And I want to bring a little Ferguson in the room. Is that cool? Is that cool, family? So, so repeat after me, all right? If you want to stand up, you want to get loose. Matter of fact, stand up. I need you to stand up, if you can, if you're able. You can shake it out a little bit. Get the little ones, y'all can get, the, get loud, OK, for me. So we're going to start off low. It's the call and repeat, and we're going to get kind of high. Is that cool? We're going to do this for the ancestors. Ashe. And this is something uh, we got from our dear Asada Shakur, and we say it in all of our movement spaces back in the States whenever we close out or open up. Some of you may be familiar. Okay, so just repeat after me. Again, I'm gonna start low, and we're gonna get high. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. A little higher now. It is a duty to fight for our freedom. It is a duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing okay, to one last time. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our shame. 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 We have nothing to lose but our shame.
One more time, brothers and sisters, please make some noise, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, I don't have too, too much to say. I am, I am going to share a, an a cappella and just reflect on one or two of the things I've heard this evening. And if, um, first of all, please, for Brother Lee, ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 please. please. <laughs> I can't even imagine, you know, if I'm honest with you, I'm not, I mean, I've lost people close to me, but most of it before I was, I was born. One of the name I, I spoke was, was an uncle of mine who died very suspiciously, to say the least, uh, in, in, in police custody, but I didn't, I didn't get to know the man. But it's the name that I call on, he was, he was an activist back in the day. But I can't imagine having to come and speak about my mother in that way. And one thing that stuck with me that Brother Lee said and, and I think it relates to the piece I want to perform for you, and it relates to one of the strategies that we need, was talking about being 10 years old and wanting to be a police officer. And then coming to the rude awakening that the world is not for you. That the people in power are not for you. That the world is not just. And I'm sure we all in this room at a different stage in our life and a different stage of our existence, even if we look at the beautiful young children in this room today, that at some stage going to have to realise the world is not for them that power is not for them, that the people that you're told are not good, are not necessarily good. As Malcolm said, if you watch the media too much, they'll have you hating the people that are oppressed. So if you watch the media in 2011, they'll talk about PC Blakelock. They're not going to talk about Cynthia Jarrett. You understand? If you watch the media during uprisings or during violence, they're going to talk about feral youth. But they're not going to talk about what the police do. They're not going to talk about the liars. And that's part of what we kind of have to live with and deal with. And so I think it's important that we name power for what it is and understand power for what it is because what we're talking about is power. And we're talking about a lack of power. Nothing else. And justice ain't coming until there's power. And so we have to understand that the best we can probably do at this point, and this is, may, may sound sad or may sound even defeatist to some, but it isn't defeatist at all. I believe it's a recognition of reality. The best we can do right now is to quell the bleeding is to work at a strategy towards being in a situation where we have power because power respects nothing but power. Exactly. And there ain't going to be no justice yeah. in white power until there's an equal and opposite black power. That's right. And that still remains to be the case. And many of us to, are, are scared to say those words because those are dangerous words. And I'm not saying it like I'm anyone special or anyone particularly, you know, who's been confronted by the rawest end of what can happen. But I think we have to look at what we're building towards and understand what we're building towards. And everyone in this room and beyond this room has a role to play. Enough of our youth them that are getting into this and that and getting into trouble or whatever else and we're going to judge them. Can you give them a job? So what, why are we judging them for? What, like when we was 15, we never did nothing. Like we enjoyed going to school without breakfast. They're talking about, what's George Osborne saying? No free school meal. How many people in here ever had free school meals when they went to school? So what do you think is going to happen if there's no free school meals? Well, I'm going to go to school hungry and then not have lunch and stay in school. That's not what it's designed for. I read something in the paper last, about four days ago, that I wanted to talk about today. This government of ours is decided, it's, they won't pay reparations, obviously. I mean, people were surprised David Cameron said he wasn't going to pay reparations. I don't know why people were surprised. But what they will do, you may have read about this, you may not, is spend 25 million pounds of British taxpayers' money to build a jail in Jamaica. When the Ross you ever hear about a government being in a jail in the, next, in the next people's country? And we giggle right now. I did a little deeper research and I found even in the Daily Fail, they're admitting, hold on a minute, Jamaicans ain't the number one group of prisoners in this country from a foreign nationality. There's over 10,000 foreign nationals in Britain's prisons. Only 700 of them are Jamaican. There's more Irish. Oh, but we're not going to build a prison in Ireland because we've got a special relationship with the Irish. That special relationship being whiteness, right? There was a time when the Irish were not white and they could get what we're getting. Today, they've been inducted into the Hall of Whiteness, and so you know what? Actually, let's not piss the paddies off again, because they're supposed to be on Team White today, so we're not going to build a jail there. Second in line was the Polish. Oh, their prisons are full, so we're not going to build a prison there. You know, we can't do that to the Polish. But the Jamaicans, a Commonwealth country, do remember that Amer Britain allowed America, its ally, to bomb a Commonwealth country, Grenada, in the 1980s, the same decade that we're talking about right now. You understand? So being in the Commonwealth ain't giving us no benefits. We're going to build a prison and we're going to send back your Jamaican criminals. Who do you think that prison's really for, brothers and sisters? Are we that stupid that we think that prison's for 700 Jamaican nationals? Are we that dumb? You don't realise it's for UNO? And for your kids? 
You don't realise British born black people, they're going to start sitting back. It's not me being paranoid. I know people this process has already attempted to happen to. So we have to recognise what time it is. And we have to organise. And we've got many, many people in our community that don't want to organise. We've got many in our people, people in our community that want to run from this till it bite them in their backside. But those who are in this room, we all need to make a pledge right now, today, as much as we may be already doing it, we're going to go out and try and do something else. Because it's going to continue, there will be injustice, that's the way of the world. What can we do so that maybe it doesn't happen to as many people's children as it's currently happening to? What can we do that, so that there are consequences, whether people like it or not, when our children die in their custody? You understand? People can put it down, people can cuss, people can say whatever they want. It might not be perfect. You understand? And then my, my, my issue with uprisings, my issue with riots, which also happen, there's a fine line between the two, is that we're not organised. We can cuss to you them all they want. They might have the heart, but if we ain't organised them, that's on us, no, as elders. If they don't understand supply lines, if they don't understand how to actually stage an uprising, if they don't understand that the police's job is to protect property. It's funny because property often gets destroyed in these scenarios and no one analyses the political significance of what that means, right? That's what we have to understand. Police are here to protect rich people. They're not even here to protect poor white people. Go to East Glasgow. Go to Salford. Go and look at what happened with the miners. They're not even here to protect working class white people. You think they're going to protect you? You must be crazy. You understand? So I think it's recognition of actually how dire the situation is and recognition that the state is not going to change its relationship to us. It's not going to suddenly become benevolent and give us justice. Part of it is, and I know I'm probably preaching to the converted in this room, but there's cameras in here, so for people who see this, it's part of this bullshit history that they teach us. William Wilberforce come along and set you all free. Yippee! This is what I was told in school. No, we burnt the fucking country down. Whether you want to like it or not, we burnt Jamaica down. And they was like, "Raw, we ain't even got no infrastructure to have slavery no more. So it ain't even tenable. It don't matter what we want to do because of Sam Sharp, because of the Baptist War, because of the Maroons, because of Paul Bogle. Now, it would have been nice if it ended peacefully. It would have been nice if it was romantic and it was because of people sending petitions to Parliament. No one saying abolition didn't have a role to play. Where are we at now? How do we organize? What do we do? How do we strategize? How do we recognize the reality of power and respond to it correctly, coldly, based on what's actually going on? And so I want to end with a little acapella that may be a bit morbid and maybe a bit depressing, but I feel like it encompasses what I've heard this evening, it encompasses the disgusting nature of the way power behaves towards us and power behaves in the world in general. You ready? Yes, sir. Whoever said that money makes the world go round, they just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They just didn't know. One more time. Who said money makes the world go round? They didn't know. Every shot that find the food at night time, don't you wonder what potential was extinguished to keep their flames burning under food or underworld and over what principles are not the same? No, we pretend they're not as if they do not control cocaine. But you find it's connected. Every kid in the hood that's living with a death wish is the same as the king who kills for the bling, but he's just much more reckless. It's the king that I'm talking about that's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Still gonna clap for the slightest to chat at any world leader that can't back it. If he's sitting on the boxes, they're just oil mineral deposits. Food he's moving, missing with our profit. So he better stop it. They say money made the world go round, but it don't. That is just not true if you ain't got guards to protect that money I regret that sunny it's more for you Only murder further agendas that money couldn't force Eliminate the foes who propose to suppose a different course Cause a little torture, usually a big supporter Though there's nothing quite like killing good riddance to non-supporters They demonise the man on the corner Paint him as a fuck, we worship murder so much It's just that he ain't killed enough You wanna commit murder and not end up in cuffs? Got to make it to the Premier League A thousand murders plus who some money make the world go round They just didn't know who said money makes the world go round? They just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They didn't know. Every knife to punch your lungs, the sons don't make you wonder Mums, if he was born to billionaires, backed by a hundred guns Would he be living still, drinking, sleeping, eating meals instead of dead Where it don't count, we expect him to be killed 
Cause living as a pauper is a fate that's tainted The greater with torture, we ain't debating The rape to the door, she was raised in particular borders Place of fame ain't particular slaughters No fate, just particular orders It's the way of the world, no accident In fact, it's immaculate They got a big gun, stop clapping it Cause the language of power devour quick Any city be a little pacifist or activist or challenges Brown no black skin savages Who inhabit in land with rules in it Think for a minute that the rhetoric was spoke hope Was not meant to be a joke, don't dream compassion What happened, it won't just go straight for the folk Cause any nation or races to prove themselves incapable Matching more than murder machines make themselves enslavable It is murder, not money, we desire insatiable Trailing and the killing is million dollar sensational Yes, what you can't do with a bribe can be achieved And the brain is with the gun and the knife Because only murder father agendas the time couldn't grind Nothing like a couple dead kids to change a parent's mind Money makes the world go round, they just didn't know Murder us in murder us in Who said money makes the world go round, they just didn't know Murder us in murder us in Who said money makes the world go round, they just didn't know Murder us in murder One more time Who said money makes the world go round, they didn't know Let's get a little clarity. You ain't got the capacity to internationally have a say in the way things happening. You expect to collect more batter in your arsenal when ain't got no nukes. Armies equipped with too few troops, laughing at you when you call troops. We've got the ritual to shoot, shoot, shoot. You got no background in colonization or public resource privatization. You can't bang with the big boys, face it. But you still wanna play like Satan. You got no death squads to call your own, nor a pilot to fly your drones. Much less bulldozers for their homes, talk gangster. Wanna name Al Capone? He was an amateur. Silly little boys don't understand. Even he went jail for tax evasion, for missing a payment in a payment plan to the man. One with a visible hand and a fist to enforce my plan. I am just because I can. More wicked than a summer of Sam. Kick your shit and I kick my fam. You bust your gun and I bomb your land. Only murder further agendas that money can't control. Nothing like a massacred village to get the problem solved. Whoever said that money makes the world go round, they just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They just didn't know. Who said money makes the world go round? They didn't know. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Our group, London, campaign against police and state violence. We're supporting families who've been affected by by violence and that's not just the punches and the kicks that the police issue we also support those and we work with other um, communities and campaign groups but people who are losing their housing people who are young people who are getting um, harassed in school we are supporting violence in the broadest sense the thing that we focus on from our experience because that's where people come to us on is the police violence that's the thing at first that first brought us together. But violence, as the sister said, is structural. It's something that happens to us all the time. When, pe when, when there's unemployment and young black people are twice as likely to be unemployed than white people, that is violence. When people are losing their, their homes here in Brixton to make way for we know who to move in the area, that is violence. But that's not what makes the news. That's not what fills our education system or what the politicians talk about. They talk about continuing that violence and they look at our resistance as violence. It's survival. And we want to bring from the elders to the youngest together to get justice, to build a new way. Because we do not want the next generation to suffer what the previous generation and this generation are suffering. Things are getting worse, but things can also improve where we show our love and care for one another. They want us to hate one another. The only thing that we can fight this with is with our, with our solidarity. Touch one, touch, touch one, touch one. This is what's going to save us. This is what's going to build a new future for us. I'm going to leave um, with Brother Lee to make the final comments. So, I've got my daughter in my hand, yeah? And um, this is what I'm fighting for, the future. Right? Now, my mom, you know, 
She's my greatest inspiration and my hero. And I'll tell you why. Because she accepted what had happened to her because she said it could have been any one of her children in that house that day. And she would have rather it have been her because she said, I was the strongest person in that house. And that's why God chose me to take that bullet. Right? And to see her survive through that, right? Without moaning or complaining, just getting on, trying to still be a parent to her children, right? And, and living for so long because they, they, they said that she would only live for 10 years and she lived for 26 years, right? I have to give my mum the utmost respect, right? And I said to myself, right? I said to myself, if she can do that for us, yeah? If she can do that for us, yeah? We must be able to do what we're doing now for her and for our future, yeah? Now, in terms of what we're faced with at the moment, with what's going on with the police and what we went through last year with the inquest and getting that result, and they're now saying that they do not want to acknowledge the damage that they have caused to us. And now we've we found ourselves fighting again, right? Now, I want us to take strength from the fact that they refused to give us legal aid last year. We did a petition and we got 133,000 people to sign <laughs> that petition. And the government had to overturn their decision not to allow us to have legal aid to then allow us to have the legal representation which we needed. And I thank Bank, Mur Bank, <laughs> Bank, Bank Murphy right, for what they did. And I thank the, um, the QC as well right, who, for what they did in that court arena right, and helped us to get that result that we've been looking for and fighting for for 29 years. And that shows the power of the people coming together, right? As Akala said, and as the young lady said, sometimes it's not about hitting the streets and, and marching and writing. There are people who can do a simple thing like sign a petition, right? And for all those people who signed that petition, justice was for you too, yeah? you can actually celebrate the fact that you was a part of that. You're a part of history and you're part of change. The changes that are happening may seem small, and they are, and we've got a long way to go. But we must acknowledge right, what we've been doing. We must acknowledge the ach small achievements that we are making. Because if we don't, then we're, we're never actually taking strength from those things that are starting all over again. Right? And our people who come before us didn't die for nothing. They did not die in vain. My mom did not die in vain. Right? So I'm going to just wrap it up by saying, I always um, use this example. You know when we used to watch Chinese films back in the days? Right? Them Kung Fu movies. Right? And you might have the little boy who witnessed his, his father getting killed. Right? And then one day, that same little boy grows up. He's a man now, and he seeks revenge. Right? I feel like I'm that little boy. Right? They came into my house, and they'd done what they did, and I felt like I wanted to do something, and I couldn't do something. And I thank God yeah, for giving me the opportunity to do something now. <laughs> And I'm going to finish with a story, right, which happened today. No word of a lie, right? Um, my, no, my wall's been knocked down, right, because we live in a little close and people reverse and, and someone's knocked down my wall, right? So and somebody else was trying to reverse today. And my wife said, Lee, quick, quick, somebody's trying, trying to reverse. They're going to hit the wall again. So I ran out and I said to him, what, what are you doing? You know, look at my wall. What's happened already? So the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. So he, st he starts to get out of his car, and I realized that 
he looked like he was struggling. So I said, you got a back problem? And he goes, I'm semi-disabled. And he said, I've got my son with me and I'm trying to find parking space because I want to put him on the bus. So I said to him, all right, I'm going to move my, my wife's car and I'm going to let you get into our space, right? And he looked at me and he said, you're a good person. He said, are you really from around here? And I said, <laughs> I said, yeah. So he says, I'm going to leave you with something, right? And this is how I live my life. He, could, he said, do one good thing today that your future self will thank you for, right? And I said to the man, you don't know how powerful that was for you to say that to me. So I'm going to say it to you. Do one good thing today that your future self will thank you for. Because sometimes we're looking to see the fruits of our labor in this lifetime. And sometimes you will never see it. My mum is not here to see the fruits of her labor. But it's happening. Right? So we must have faith that we will have a better future for what we do today. So I want everybody, if you haven't signed that petition, right, against the police, to the commissioner, please sign that petition and support what we're doing. Yeah? Thank you for coming. Thank you for the continuous support that you've been giving myself and my family. Yeah? And the little young ones here, this is powerful for them to see what is happening right here and right now. Yeah? Thank you very much. Love. Okay. Is um, Lorna G here to, to end us? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> when I look at that picture, <laughs> it's very powerful. Um, Cherry is my older sister, my mother's first child. And um, growing up, she uh, left an amazing impression on me. Uh, I spent most of my time there because Cherry was of a very free-spirited person she's very very free spirited so there were no great big rules and laws in her house and i loved it this is the house where i heard i first heard about percy sledge sam cook al green master griffiths you know james brown marvin gay all these all these music i used to listen to when I went to my sister's house, because um, growing up as a Seventh Day Adventist in our, our household, we wasn't really allowed to play that kind of music. <laughs> no wonder I turned out to be a musician. But you know, we, we wasn't really allowed to play you know th that that kind of music. So when I would go to Cherry's house, my gosh, I was in heaven. I was in heaven, and um, you know, th just she had this way of always saying, you know what, just be free, free man, be who you are, just be free. She always, always had this. And her children are a testimony of how uh, Cherry Gross was, how she, how she moved in life, how she raised her children, yeah, with such confidence and such love, you know, um, unconditional love also. Because all this time, through this, this, this whole time that Cherry's been paralyzed, uh, all these years, and I must admit, it was very, obviously, can, can you imagine how hard it was for the children? You know, she has a family, she has brothers and sisters, she had a mother, our mother, um, and it, so it was hard, very, very hard for all involved. And they'd show all on the news and everything and, you know, all the riots and the uprisings and all these stories and, and, and all this kind of thing. But there was a, there was a us there um, seeing this. And um, I had many conversations with Lee. Um, I, I was around my nephews and my nieces quite a lot and I've seen their journey and one thing that I will say is Cherry never showed any hate yeah 
she never showed any hate for these people that did what they did to her. And um, it's really funny because even now, whilst uh, Lee is um, heading this campaign for justice, and I know that it's God moving from him. It's not him doing this. I know that it's God like doing this through him. It's, it's the, I know that feeling when you know you can't stop. I can't sit down because all is not finished. I know that feeling. So I know, you know, what what's going what's going on and all of Cherry's children are feeling the 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 hurt, the injustice. Thank God we have Lee that can speak and that can, you know, head this campaign and express the way all of us are feeling. So I just wanna um at the time when when this did happen, and my mom came to, I was staying at my friend's house that night because we 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 we, we, rave, we raved the night before, and I stayed at my friend Cecil's house. And then the morning, I saw my mom and my brothers and my sisters coming, yeah. And Cecil was like, "Oh my God, your mom and all of them's coming to the house." I'm like, "What?" I straight away I knew something was wrong because like why are they all coming? And they came, knocked the door, and everybody's face was like. Oh, no, you know, my brother, my, my brother Mervyn said, sit down. I was like, what, what, what's going on? And I just started to cry straight away. I was like, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening? What's, why is everybody here? And then, you know, um, yeah, my brother, it was Mervyn that said, actually, uh, God rest his soul, that, uh, you know, um, Cherry's been shot. <laughs> what? It's like, that's the last thing that I was expecting to hear. But um, he's like, yeah, Cherry's been shot. Well, uh, yeah, they, they was apparently looking for Michael and blah, blah. Look, we're all going to go down to the house now. We're gonna and it was just, like, it was just crazy. It was mad because I don't remember leaving my f Cecile's house and going to the house. I just remember appearing at the house. And when we appeared at the house, 22 Normandy Road, which is just right around the corner, literally, I just saw a crowd outside confusion, cameras, police, all kinds of things. But one thing that I do remember, all right, at the end of the, after maybe a few hours where we were, we were just trying to find out what was going on, and um, my mum was saying, you know, that he's going to take the kids to the house, they're going to go to the hospital. I was like, you know what? I'm going to the police station, mate. Right? So, let's go. And I don't know, right? I don't know where I was in the crowd, if I was at the beginning, the middle, or in the end, at the end of the crowd. But all I know that I walked from there to the police station because I wanted answers. And I remember being at the police station at the back gate because I visited that police station before. Okay? Right? I mean, I lie. I've visited that police station before. I know those streets of Brixton. I grew in those streets of Brixton. So I know. Yeah, and I so and I stood out there with the rest of the crowd and I was asking for the police to come out, come out, come out and answer for what you've done, come out and uh, and that's all the rage that I felt. And one before I go, I I did write a song around that time, about that time, but what I did write was a was, was something like this. Police can sit. Police can plan. Police can walk with gun in them and bust down your door. Shoot you in your back without no reason. Police can attack. Oh yes, I know what police can do. Babylon, you wicked. Them talk but we can't fight against the system. But me no business. So me not too care. Cause right now the system's not in a wheelchair. The system it stink. The system unjust. The system tell me murder we fit trust. Oh yes, I know what police can do. And then when I went to my professor, yeah, because I was doing my tune, and I got to him, this is what I want to record. And he was like, well, I know, it might be a little bit too, you know, rough right now. You know, do something more that everybody can relate to and everything. And I still had it in my heart. I still had that grievance in my heart. But what I had and what I know and what I knew then and what I know now is that we have to find a way. And that's why 
this tune came out. Because actually, when I looked at it all, it wasn't just about, you know, this, 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 these untoward, you know, actions of this uh, uh, organization that they call the police force. It's uh, with, 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 with Cherry, there is a lot more going on. But one thing, you know, they can't steal our minds. That's one thing they cannot do, is steal our minds. So here's to Lee, right? Because he is the change that we want to see in this world. And that's what we have to do. We have to be the change that we want to see. And he is showing that, okay? And that's what we all individually have to do, is just be the change that we want to see. Okay? Okay, let's go. To go, gotta find a way to show what I've got to show. I gotta find a way. E yeah, I've been searching a long, long time, see, just to find the thing that's right for me. Always been such a long, empty road. Still no conclusion, still no way out. I just gotta find a way, gotta find a way, yeah. Gotta find a way to show what I've got to show. I gotta find a way. Yeah, hear me now. <laughs> see, 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 my back is against the wall. Try as they may, wicked now get me to follow. My head is high, I'm going to stand tall. No matter how the traffic hit me, don't me now fall. Hey, uh, must find a way to end it all. Got to get on, baby, once and for all. Gotta find a way. No say no, no, no. Don't they know I got a mind of my own? I want to live my life every day with no one, no one in my way. Sing out now. Gotta find a way, gotta find a way. Gotta find a way, gotta find a way. Gotta find a way to get where I've got to go. Gotta find a way to show what I've got to show. You will find a way, yeah. Oh, find a way. Must find a way. Brother Lee, we have to find a way. Oh, well, yes. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody, eat some food now. Evening, everybody. Evening. I'm Granny Cherry's granddaughter. 
that I'm going to read this on behalf of the family. Dear Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, I write further to our previous correspondent as we approach the fourth anniversary of the death of our mother, Dorothy Cherry Gross, on the 24th of April, 2011. As you will be aware, this year will also mark the 30th anniversary of the events of the 28th of September, 1985, when our mother was shot by the officers of Metropolitan Police <coughs> in her own home in front of us, her children, leading to the injuries which caused her eventful death. Moreover, we are acutely aware that we are fast approaching the first anniversary of your public apology and acknowledgement on the 10th of July, 2014, in respect of the failures of the Metropolitan Police as an organization. During and since the 1985 police operation, which caused, as you recognize, irreparable damage to a mother and her family, you were kind enough to repeat your apology in person to us when, you met with, when we met with you. As your request, on the 5th of August, 2014, you also assured us then of your good faith and that you wanted to do whatever you could in respect of compensation and reparation for the irreparable damage we have offered, we have suffered, sorry, as recognized by you. Indeed, in your subsequent letter of the 4th of, of September 2014 to us, you sought to reassure us that you were endeavoring to achieve a satisfactory resolution of the matters discussed, that you had spoken to the deputy mayor who has agreed to review the circumstances and that you had asked your legal team to draft a report for the MOPAC. Following the submission of relevant details on our behalf to your legal team for the purposes of that report, you sought to reassure us again in your letter of the 26th of January 2015 that since our meeting there had been progress and positive communication with the aim of taking the due legal process forward and you expressed your hope that matters can be taken forward without any unnecessary delay. For our part, as we sought to explain at our meeting and in any subsequent letters to you, we accepted your apologies, your acknowledgements and your assurances in good faith, thanking you for your expressed commitment to a proper resolution of this matter After almost three decades, we and our family will be able to, long last, to move forward. Sorry. In this light, I have to say that we are acutely puzzled, disappointed and saddened by the letter of the 27th of March 2015 from your legal team saying that simply that no steps had, had been or will be taken on your behalf to achieve the resolution that you said you were endeavoring to achieve. In view of your knowledge and recognition of the relevant facts and given the sentiments expressed by you previously at your meeting with us and in your letters to me, we find it difficult to understand how and why you have chosen not to, to, cut, chosen to come to this path. The only explanation that might make sense is that your legal team is acting without the benefits of instructions from you in person, but that is almost impossible to conceive. Perhaps you could help us understand how you reconcile what you have said to us in the past with what would now happen and we'll be prepared to meet with you again to allow you opportunity to do so. After three decades, we are hoping that at last things will be different and we give you good opportunity to show us and to our community that things have changed. We remain prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt to reach out to you so that you have a further chance to do the right thing by us, by our community, and by yourself and your officers. If you spurn this chance, we shall be left with no option but to conclude that will we have tried to be fair with you, to give you the opportunity to do the right thing. You have used this opportunity only to add insult to injury, that you perhaps not the man of your words that you claim to be. 
that in fact nothing has changed in these three decades and that the apology that the words you offer last year means nothing because they have not been backed up with action. We shall be left to worry about the future of the next generation in our community and their relations with the Metropolitan Police. It remains only to make it clear that, if necessary, we shall continue to fight for our rights and stand up for ourselves as our mother would want us if she were still alive. Your sincerity, Lee Lawrence, on behalf of the Gross family. Thank you. We just wanted to be totally transparent with you about what has taken place thus far. And you can see for yourself, that's the letter, you can see for yourself how unfair this system is, right? And in this very case, right, where they have done wrong, there's no two sides to this story. They've, we brought them to an inquest, proved them wrong. They've then apologized, engaging with those wrongs and are still not prepared to do something about the damage that they have caused and admit they have caused. If we don't get justice in this, we do have to worry about our future people, right? So we must know this doesn't just affect this family. This is about all of us. Thank you. Good night. Enjoy the rest of the evening.